What's up everybody, Johannes Moser here, and this is my masterclass for Strad Magazine on the Brahms E minor Sonata Opus 38 for cello and piano. Some might argue it's for piano and cello. Irrelevant, we got lots to talk about what is in the score and what I think is worth noticing. Before we get into the details, I recommend that you buy the issue of Strat Magazine where you will find my printed bowings and my fingerings, most importantly. And this video is meant to work alongside that printed uh, score. I really hope you enjoy this class. Let's dive right in. When you look at my edits of the score, um, you might be surprised that I took very little liberties of uh, gluing notes together or separating bows. I've kept almost all the bows as they were um, intended by Brahms. One can argue, of course, on the one hand, that these are only bows for phrasing, but actually, when you play the bows, they have a huge speaking quality. And that is essential for a lot of German music, is that there is a lot of um, relations uh, from music to language. For me, Brahms had a kind of retro idea when he composed this piece. He had a great affinity for musical antiques. Um, reading scores of Bach uh, was one of his favorite pastimes. And there is a lot of um, antique music in this piece. Uh, if we go backwards, the third movement, you know, being uh, an incredible fugue, and of course Bach is, uh, is known to be the master of fugues. We go into the second movement, we have a very uh, baroque kind of minuet form uh, for the first part, and then Brahms, I guess, can't help himself and dives into full-blown romanticism for the trio. And in the first movement, there are some people that argue that um, it was very much inspired by the third contrapunctus of the Art of Fugue by Johann Sebastian Bach. So you have a lot of references that point backwards. And um, as you will see in the class, that has a lot of significance um, for choices to make. The first question always is, what tempo do I choose? The cello starts right from the first note with this beautiful theme and the piano is accompanying with uh, chords on the second and fourth beat. So there is not really a lot of structure to work with. Therefore, I recommend that you jump a couple of bars forward in your mind before starting the piece. Look at the piano part in bar 34. see the upper voice is made out of triplets and these triplets need to have a certain flow to create a line. If they're too slow they sound choppy. So with those triplets in in your mind start the theme. All right let's check out the beginning of the first movement. Some of you may be surprised that I am starting this movement with up bow but the bowing unfolds very naturally. Let me play the first eight bars for you. the third beat, so the second note in the bar, is actually really important to turn the phrase around. So I'm very happy to have that on a, up, on a down bow. And then look in bar 7 um, on the third beat, which is also the second note. Um, I'm also very happy to have a lot of tension on the F sharp, so I can do a resolution. Um, when you look at the very beginning, it says piano espressivo and then legato. So, uh, you know, why didn't he just put legato bows um, over each note? In my opinion, um, he didn't do that to make it more speaking. 
Let me show you the difference. Yeah. Of course, you have fantastic legato, but you're losing a little bit of consonants. Yeah. Yeah. It speaks much more. If you are uncomfortable with starting up bow, no problem at all. Start down bow and then just hook the um, second and third note in the first bar and you have the same bowing basically. I use that bowing uh, when I do the repeat. So, you know, you can have a little variation right there. In bar 18 and 19, you have no piano accompaniment. So you possibly have uh, the freedom to um, take a little bit of time, just be aware that you should not fall completely out of the tempo because in uh, bar 20 the um, piano comes in with a theme and you want to prepare the entrance in the tempo that you've started with, which is flowing of course. So um, if you take a little bit of time here... <laughs> Now's the time to recap the tempo. So that you can actually keep the flow. Don't be surprised about the bowing that I left in 32. Uh, this is often overlooked um, because arguably <laughs> it's, it's a long stretch for one bow. However, um, it will bring you right back um, to an up bow uh, so you can play the theme um, on separate bows again. It's a long bow, but um, it's worth keeping the legato. I think it is a beautiful gesture. Look at bar 46. Now, this is a long stretch to only play forte, so you need to have what I call microdynamics. You need to um, make sure that you don't blast through the whole thing, but you keep a little bit um, of flexibility, um, especially when you come to bar 50 to have enough muscle to actually uh, give it even more of a push because you move from the E flat to the E natural and that is kind of a big step harmonically. Yeah. So it's all forte, arguably, um, but there is shades in there. 50 shades of forte. Oftentimes I hear that cellists stop the phrase in bar 65 on the third beat. And the phrase is not over yet. The phrase is actually completed by the piano. So you need to make sure that you don't do a big fussy ritenuto um, right before that third beat, but you actually lead through and give the phrase to the pianist. <laughs> That was my imaginary pianist I was giving the phrase to. <laughs> Look at bar 83 and 85. You have Espressivo in 83 and you have Dolce in uh, 85. Now, the translation for Dolce is sweet. Yeah, when you go to Italy and you order a Dolce, expect a nice tiramisu or a panna cotta. My point is, there needs to be a difference between Espressivo and Dolce and you seldomly hear that. Mm, because we start in with a very um, tight chromatic uh, scale, I find that this is a very inward espressivo rather than, you know, very exuberant. Um, and then in dolce, because you have this beautiful um, major tonality, um, you can actually um, really indulge also in the crescendo diminuendo um, hairpins that you have in 85. 
So as you could see at the Esposivo part, I was um, using quite a dense bow and uh, quite a quick vibrato. I loosened up my vibrato a little bit in the dolce part and used more bow. One of the essential building blocks of this first movement from the Brahmsi minor sonata you find in bar 78, which is the falling fifth. <laughs> For example, if you look at the um, beginning of the um, development, uh, that is just a variation of that building block. Now, as you may have noticed, I am phrasing these two notes a little bit in a classical way, which means that I'm playing the second note slightly shorter than the first note as opposed to this is my way of paying homage to Brahms's idea of um, making this kind of a retro piece and um, as you know in classical style you actually um, shorten the second note of um, two notes slightly, which sounds a little bit like this when you look, for example, at uh, uh, Haydn Concerto. Mm. Uh, so my bowing is two and two, so... Mm, which I like much more than... Uh, I find that a bit thick. Tell your pianist to do the same, because that actually <laughs> gives you a chance to come through the most expansive version of uh, this building block you find uh, starting with the upbeat to 118 which is the uh, almost infamous place yeah. again you have the building block which is the following and Brahms uh, filled it kindly with so that you don't have to jump over the open strings. Now, a lot of cellists play these filling notes more importantly than actually the outer notes. And I think that is wrong. I think you need to um, pay most attention to having a very rhythmical structure in the outer notes and just fill in the blanks with the small notes, but don't let the small notes uh, distort uh, the rhythm. There is the argument to be made about the amount of vibrato. I think you don't need to go too crazy with vibrato because that just draws melodic attention to this purely uh, harmonic situation. In bar 103 and 104, again, we have quite uh, a long legato, which is often dismissed as just a phrasing bow. But I encourage you to actually try and play the full bow. That way you have a long, long, long legato and it prevents you from actually getting self-indulgent and slowing down the tempo for explosivity reasons. Um, you cannot slow down for one second uh, just because the bow is so long, you would run out of bow immediately. Let's talk about the transition of bar 133 to 134. Obviously, you come with full force into 133 and you have that C major chord. Be aware that there are two um, eighth note rests, one is on the last eighth note of the bar 33 and one on the first eighth note of 34, 134. Um, I suggest that you uh, dampen the strings slightly um, and don't dampen them here because you will get an ugly sound of uh, you will you will just stop the note but actually dampen it behind if you need to. Yeah. There, that way um, you keep the uh, 
you keep the string from getting blocked immediately, you actually have like a enforced diminuendo on the um, on the lower strings. It's important to do that because otherwise your chord is just going to bleed into those two rests. Ah, it's ringing forever, basically. So I would suggest that um, yeah, that you that you clean the sound a little bit. Um, and then be aware that the piano actually has uh, two eighth notes uh, before you um, with the interval of a fourth. And you play a third. So I suggest that the, th that the fourth in the piano has the leading voice for the first, I think it is four bars. Um, and you always answer with a, with a um, small third. Four bars later, the uh, rolls change. Then you have the fourth, and the piano has. So now you've turned it around. Now the cello has the leading voice, and um, piano needs to answer slightly less um, pronounced. Talking about bowings, there is a nice little detail in bar 178, 179 you see that he puts a legato over two bars. Uh, when you compare that with the very beginning, actually, um, you have three different bows. Um, what is really cool about this bowing is that it pays tribute to what is going on in the piano. In the piano, you actually have continuous eighth notes. And if you were to separate this, bow, this phrase too much, then what would happen is that the piano would have to slow down its eighth notes and react to you, whereas actually I almost feel like uh, in this part I am actually accompanying uh, the eighth notes of the piano so that the eighth notes can have a beautiful flow and you don't disrupt that. And that bowing is going to help you very much uh, to achieve that. Let me show you what I mean. to separating the bow. Yeah. That will work very well for the first time, but the second time, because you have the underlying eighth notes continue on, um, pianist will thank you. In bar 195, I thought it was a cool idea to play everything on the C string. It gives a great sonority. Um, you definitely need to check your bow and see how far you actually need to move to the bridge. I need to move um, about a centimeter or one and a half centimeters more towards the bridge in order to make it sound really um, as growling as I would like it to be. Okay, arguably in bar 256, we are starting a very, very, very long uh, bow. And that is Brahms' idea. Certainly, you know, you can say it is a phrasing bow. And I completely uh, agree with you if in concert you want to separate those bows a little bit. But just for practicing purposes, try it out once, how it feels like. Um, so, this is my attempt at doing this. Yeah. So, it's just about possible. And if your pulse is a little higher and you feel in concert, it's not going to work. Divide the bows. It's no problem, but practice it this way. Um, your ear and your feeling will actually train for long trajectory phrasing. One last thing before we go into the second movement is to talk about how to end the piece. I personally like to use as little uh, ritenuto or rallentando um, as possible at the end 
just because I feel it's already composed. The three last bars are the same chord, lets the piece finish by itself, basically. Um, so I like to choose uh, simplicity over, you know, turning this into a big schmaltzy ending. Welcome back everybody to the Brahms E minor sonata second movement and I have a fantastic bowing for you starting down bow. <laughs> so cool about this bowing is that it helps you emphasize the structure of this menuet which is in the theme two bar two bar four bar two bar and then either another two bar phrase or two separate bars let me show you what I mean first two bar phrase second one now we have four bars. Now we have two bars again. And then I think two separate ones. You could also argue that it's that it's again a two bar phrase. That depends on, on how you like to phrase this. Now, when you continue using this bowing, uh, that I've suggested, you're actually emphasizing the harmonic um, structure. Uh, I suggest that you start with an up bow, which is in the tomica, and then you have a down bow for the dominant. Yeah. So, um, in the end, if you do the bowings as I suggest them, 60% of um, your musical homework has already been done for you. And of course, then you need to make decisions on, um, you know, on the kind of color that you want to use and vibrato, which is what I want to talk about now. Because this is such a reference uh, to a Baroque uh, form, I suggest that in the uh, first part of the Allegretto Quasi Menuetto, uh, you are, don't use too much vibrato. Now, of course, you could argue, but wait a second. Um, Brahms, of course, is always to be played with a lot of vibrato because it is romantic music. Well, to be fair, when uh, you read uh, letters from Josef Jochim, for whom the Brahms Violin Concerto was written, he said that vibrato was of terrible taste. Now, you know, today we need to take that with a grain of salt because we are also playing steel strings, so uh, we need to soften the sound a little bit. Um, so I do not encourage you to play absolutely with no vibrato, because that could get a little bit annoying, but if you um, restrain yourself to, just to let the string live a little bit, um, I think it is much nicer than putting romantic ketchup and uh, vibrato barbecue sauce onto each note. Yeah, makes it unnecessarily thick and self-important and also it takes all the elegance out of it, in my opinion. <laughs> Uh, 
So all the expression and all the dancing elegance should happen in the right hand. Look at upbeat of bar 39. We come to a phrase that is underlined with grazioso and uh, here Brahms inserts a little bit of memory of uh, romanticism. Yeah? So he's going back to the future just for a couple of bars. So uh, I suggest that you use quite a centered, um, intimate but, but intense vibrato um, to show that change of grazioso and then really where the grazioso happens is on um, the little trill in the second bar of the phrase. Yeah. You can also try it absolutely without vibrato. Yeah. So I was restricting vibrato and uh, to the note of the trill. This, of course, is up to your interpretation, and I don't uh, want to tell you what to do in that instance. But experiment with the idea of using vibrato versus non-vibrato. I think in this movement it's very uh, challenging and worth trying. However, after you've finished this grazioso part, you go back into the role of playing the double bass. Yeah? Grazioso is probably over <laughs> for uh, a little while. Um, so be very conscious about, uh, about that shift from Grazioso to, um, to double bass, basically. This is something for the geeks and I count myself <laughs> into that group so I want to share something with you. Uh, when you look at bar 71 we obviously have a very clear hemiola there. Yeah. But if you want to experiment there is a hemiola um, three bars earlier um, when you play you could also see it as a hemiola. You might have to change the crescendo diminuendo just slightly, um, but for example, when you do it in the uh, repeat, when you come back from the trio, could be a variation that might be very interesting just for yourself. The pizzicati, although they are piano, don't play them too high actually play them relatively close um, to the end of the fingerboard so that they're actually speaking and that you can send them into the hall. Yeah, if you are too intimate your, with your pizzicati, people will see them but will not hear them. Okay, So give them a little bit more punch. And be very mindful that you have the dominant chord and the tonic. So dominant, of course, needs to be stronger. So what you could do is to move back one or two centimeters um, when you play the uh, tonic. Coming to the trio, one of the most difficult things is to coordinate um, cello and piano. And I have a little trick that I've used over the years and it has saved me uh, hours and hours and hours of rehearsal time and actually opens up uh, the avenue for a lot of creativity. When you go into rehearsal next time with your pianist, try the following. For the first part, let's say the cello is leading, then when you do the repeat of the first part, the piano is leading. The piano can also lead at the beginning of the second part and when the second part is repeated, the cello leads. Of course, you can you can change that around. That the leadership goes from piano, cello, cello, piano, or piano, cello, piano, cello, or whatever. You know, there is there is a couple of uh, variations that you can 
um, make there. Now the leading instrument should not only lead in dynamic, but also in rubato and uh, the non-leading instrument should be behind like a shadow. Now you may find that you might not always be 100% together because the following instrument is maybe slightly behind the leading instrument, but because you have a higher dynamic in the leading instrument, um, it just it, it doesn't seem like it's not together, um, but actually it seems like these instruments are creating a space in between each other. It is a very uh, complicated um, explanation for something that is going to be very simple, very helpful, very effective, and um, it just works. In the trio, of course, the vibrato situation has changed. And, um, you know, Brahms writes these long bows of legato. And what you need to make sure is that you don't only play legato in the right hand, but also in the left hand. Left hand legato is very important here, so that you vibrate from each note to the next. Let me explain that while playing slowly. I almost don't stop the vibrato, but I just change the finger. You can also do one run without any vibrato at all, for example. how expressive then you are in your right hand. It's a very cool moment when you return from the trio to the menuetto um, and I would almost exaggerate the dryness and the, um, the formality of the first part versus the second part. <laughs> back from the trio uh, with very stirred up emotions and you end this movement with a lot of poise and control. All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this little masterclass on uh, the first and second movement of the Brahms minor sonata. Um, if you have any questions or if you want me to follow up on something else, uh, leave some comments in the comment section below. Uh, please subscribe and um, thank you to Strad Magazine for letting me do this um, nice little masterclass for them. And see you next time. Bye-bye.